We're going to study a topic that is very, very important, that is absolutely critical in our relationship with God. It's the reason why we do what we do. And we're going to see that it's absolutely fundamental to, to think on these scriptures and to know these things that we're going to talk about today. We're going to begin in the book of Proverbs in chapter 2 and verse 1. And the book of Proverbs we know is the Proverbs of Solomon. But this first section of the book of Proverbs is written by a father to his son. And we could speculate whether David wrote this for his son Solomon or not. But in any case, it still applies to us because we are the children of God, like the Apostle John says in 1 John 3. We are the children of God, and God the Father is our Father. Jesus said that. that he was ascending to his Father and our Father. That applies to us. And it's with, with this context, with this perspective, that I would like for us to read these verses here in Proverbs 2. Because these are the instructions of God the Father to us, what we are to do, and how we are to do it. In verse 1, it says, My son, if you will receive my words and treasure up my commandments within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yea, if you cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you shall understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And if you like titles, that would be the title for this message, The Knowledge of God. But there are a lot of things here that God tells us to do. And the very first thing that we have to do is to receive his words. That's what he says. If we receive those words, it starts with believing God and believing the Bible that is the only source of absolute pure truth on the earth. And then we have to treasure those commandments within us. That's why he's writing them in our hearts and in our minds. That's why he's giving us his spirit so that he can do that, so that he can change us. And we understand that conversion is a process and it takes time. But it absolutely requires all of these steps that we receive his words, that we treasure those commandments within us, because this is going to lead to the next thing, that we can in incline our ear to wisdom and apply our heart to understanding. So these two things imply action on our part, that cooperation with God's process of conversion. We have to incline our ear to hear to wisdom, and then we have to apply our heart to understanding. And then it says, if we cry after knowledge, because knowledge is like the beginning, we, the first thing we have to have is knowledge. But knowledge puffs, puffs up. Knowledge by itself is not enough. We have to then have understanding of that knowledge. And it's how th that knowledge is put together. That's what understanding is. How it's put together to really get the full picture, to get that understanding. And then understanding is not enough. Then we have to go on to wisdom, which is applying that understanding and that knowledge to actually live by these words. That's why we have to hear wisdom so that we can learn and that we can do. But we have to seek her silver and, and search for, for that as for hidden treasures. Because if we do these things, then we will understand the fear of the Lord, which is a whole topic in and of itself. But I want to focus on the second part of verse 5, because it says that if we do these things, we will find the knowledge of God. And why is this important? This is absolutely critical in our walk with God, to find that knowledge of God. It is paramount to really everything that we do. Because God himself said that. Jesus prayed. Let's go to John 17 to read that prayer. But he prayed to his father. And this is something that he said. How important is that knowledge of God? In John 17, we're going to read verse 3. Because this, is, this tells us how important is it to find this knowledge of God? Jesus said when he was praying to the father, 
in John 17, verse 3, for this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you did send. And they're both God, who knows God the Father and God the Son. That's why it's both, that we may know him, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who is also God, but that we may know them both. That is eternal life, knowing them both. That is eternal life. We know that he was praying this before he was crucified, but he was saying something so profound that it's hard for us to wrap our minds around it. But this is exactly what God wants us to do. This is the purpose of our calling, that we may know God. That is eternal life. And we're going to study these, this topic of the knowledge of God because it is so important that we get to know God. And not just in a knowledge sense, but in an understanding and in a wise way that we can be walking with God, that we can be led by Him. Let's go to Jeremiah 9. We're going to see how important it is because we have to, we have to have this firmly ingrained in our minds how critical it is, how important it is to God who created us, who has a plan for us, who has called us according to his purpose, that we would have that, that we will have that knowledge of him. That is exactly what God wants. We just read that that is eternal life. This is the, the, the third verse, the third thing that, that Jesus said in that prayer right before he died, before he gave his life for us and the meaning of everything. And he explained so much in that one chapter, in that one prayer. But this is what God really desires. Let's go to Jeremiah 9. We're going to begin in verse 23. Jeremiah 9, 23. It says, Thus says the Lord, Do not let the wise man glory in his wisdom. So it's not even only wisdom. Wisdom is above understanding, above knowledge, and is really important when we want that. But it's not only wisdom, it's beyond that. It's what we saw in verse 5 that is going to lead us to if we do these things, if we dedicate our lives to that as, if, as though we're trying to find silver or hidden treasure. Because for physical things, maybe we would do it. If we knew there was a treasure there, we would, we would probably stop everything we're doing with, with go dick and trying to find that treasure. But God wants us to do it with that amount of diligence and dedication. But even wisdom is not the pinnacle. Do not let the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor let the mighty man glory in his might. That's not what it's about. Do not let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. And this is a critical part because it tells us so much. These scriptures tell us so much about God, his mind, his purpose, his plan. This is what God wants. This is what he desires for us. He desires that we get to know him. And then he starts giving us some of his attributes, some of his character. So it's both. He's basically saying the maximum glory that any human being could ever achieve are not riches, are not wisdom, are not achievements. It's not any of that. It's just that they would know me. That's what God wants. And that's what we should want, brethren. We should want to know God, to really know God. That is what God desires. That is his purpose. That is exactly what, that is exactly what, what Moses wanted, what all the men of God wanted, all the patriarchs, David. That's why he wrote all these Psalms. That's why he wrote all these things. But we, we see examples. We're going to see examples that this is exactly what, what they understood, what they wanted, what they desire. Right? In one of the Psalms, David said, I desire 
Besides you, I desire none upon earth. Nothing. Nothing else. Let's go to Exodus 33 where we can see something else too regarding this. We'll see what Moses said. Exodus 33. He was the, the meekest man. But it's amazing. It's amazing what, what God is saying here. Exodus 33 and verse 13. And this is what Moses is, is asking God. He's pleading with him. He's praying to him. And he says, now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, make me see now your way that I may know you. That was the purpose. The purpose of knowing God's way, it's to know God. And that's exactly what Moses wanted. He said, if I have found grace in your sight, he was not assuming, he was not presuming anything. He was seeking God's mercy, God's love, and his favor. He had it. But then what he asked for, make me, make me see now your way that I may know you. It wasn't about the way. It wasn't about the people. It wasn't about the plan for Israel. It was about him personally wanting to know God. And that's what Abraham wanted. And that's what Jacob wanted. And that's what Joseph, that's what all of the men of God have in common. That this is what they wanted. They wanted to know God. Do you want to, want to know God that way? Do you want to know God that way? Do I want to know God that way? It says that I might find grace in your sight. And then he says, and consider that this nation is your people. But the purpose is to know God. To know God, because to know God is everything. We've read it. It is eternal life. It is the whole purpose of why we're here, is to get to know God, to be sons and daughters born in his kingdom. Let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Because these, this topic of knowing God is all over the Bible, all over. We can see it if we pay attention to it. If our antennas are up to understand, to see, what does this mean? What does he mean to know God? And what does the Bible tell us about knowing God? Ephesians 4, verse 13. And sometimes in this verse, we focus on the first part. It says, until we all come into the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. It says, unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Sometimes we focus on that, on the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ because it's about us. But we have to read what this says, the first part of these verse, where it says, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Same thing, knowing God, knowing Jesus Christ himself, knowing the Son of God, really getting to know him because this is absolutely critical in our walk with God is absolutely critical to the plan of God and to the transformation that he is carrying out in each and every one of us. That is exactly what God wants. Let's go to Mark 12. Mark 12, because this is where the first and the second greatest commandments are. I, I know that many of us know these scriptures by heart, by memory, but we're going to read something important here. Because this, this is like what Jesus responds to this, to this scribe is very, very important. Let's, gonna, let's start in, in, in verse 28, Mark 12, 28. It says, And one of the scribes who had come up to him, after hearing them reasoning together and perceiving that he answered them well, meaning Jesus, he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Then Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is here, O Israel. Our one God is the Lord, the Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. But how can you love someone that you don't know? You have to know that person. And with God is reciprocal. The more you know him, the more you love him. The more you love him, the more you get to know him. He will reveal himself to you. He says, this is the first commandment, and the second is like this. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. Verse 32, then the scribe said to him, Bright master, you have spoken according to truth that God is one and there is not another besides him. And we don't know if he, this was, he was taking a shot at him because he was, he was a clan, that he was a son of God. Or maybe he was sincere. But his words are correct. He says, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, we come back to these words again that we read in Proverbs. To love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one, one's neighbor as oneself is more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Meaning this is what God really desires. He commanded burnt offerings. He commanded sacrifices. Yes, and they were still in effect then. But what did Jesus respond? And Jesus seeing that he ans answered he, with understanding. This is not just knowledge. He knew that, but he was understanding the things that he needed to do. He was understanding that. And the answer, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to question him anymore. But what, what did Jesus say? You are not far from the kingdom of God. You're getting it. You have the knowledge. You have the understanding. Now go and apply that. Now go have wisdom. Because you know what God really wants. You know what God really desires. Let's go to Matthew 9. Matthew 9. And it, because Jesus tried to explain these, these things. He tried to teach people about these things. Now, people sometimes, you know, in particular the Pharisees in this case, they didn't pay attention. They didn't, they, they were not so much interested in learning as much as getting honor and getting glory and getting praise from men. That's what God said. But in Matthew 9 and, and verse 11, and this is, this is after, you know, Jesus comes and sees Matthew and he, he, he goes, you know, and starts eating, eating in the house with the tax collectors and sinners. And after seeing this in verse 11, the Pharisees said to his disciples, what does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? But Jesus, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are strong do not have need of a physician but those who are sick. Now go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And it's amazing because he was telling them, go and learn what this means. Go study this scripture. Open, open the scriptures and learn what this means. And it's important. It's important that we, that we understand this because what happens, what happens then is they, they did not learn that. Let's go to Matthew 12. We, we, we can corroborate that, that they did not learn that because then, you know, there's another incident here where they're there. And, and this one in Matthew 12 and verse one, this is when Jesus was walking with his disciples on the Sabbath day. And in verse one, it says at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath days and his disciples were hungry and they began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat. But after seeing these, the Pharisees said to him, behold, your disciples are doing that, doing what, what, what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he himself and those with him were hungry? How he went into the house of God and he ate the loaves of showbread, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but for the priests only. We know that he was from the tribe of Judah. He was not a Levite. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Because they, he, he's not saying that, that, you know, that that is not profaning the Sabbath. He says, that it is. That's a lot of work, butchering all those animals and doing all these sacrifices and offerings. He says, but then what does he say? Verse six, but I say to you, there is one here who is greater than the temple. So you have to understand, you have to understand who you're dealing with. And then he tells him in verse seven, now, if you had known what these means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. You wouldn't have done that. But you didn't go to the scriptures to learn 
what it says there. Well, we're going to do that right now. Let's go, let's go to Hosea 6.6. 6. That's where this is at. Because there's something very interesting here. It's hidden because he only gives the first part of the verse. And this is what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to go to the scriptures, to go to the book of Hosea and read what he says there. They knew where that was written. Hosea 6.6. 6. It says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. Just think about that, brethren, for a minute. What does God really desire? He desires mercy and the knowledge of God. That's what he really wants. And it goes together with loving him. It goes together with the first and greatest commandment. If they would have read Hosea 6, they would have understood that what God really wants is for you to know him. Is for you to really know him and worship him and learn from him and have a relationship with him and have a heart that is sincere and given to him completely in spirit and in truth, not just an emotional thing, not just on the outside, not just in praise and song. Those are good things, but he really wants us to have a relationship with him and that implies knowing him. That implies that knowledge. That's what God wanted them to do. And they did not do that. And it's very important. It's so important that this is the reason. This is a salvational issue. Absolutely. It's so important that our salvation depends on this. It really does. Let's go to Matthew 25. Because it is the knowledge of God. And there's a lot of other things that we can study about the knowledge of God. But this is what God wants. He wants you to know him. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants all your thoughts. He wants your heart completely dedicated to him. This is not a sanctimonious thing or an external thing or a religious thing. No, this is a matter of the heart. This is a matter of knowing a person. This is a relationship. That word is not in the Bible, but everything is speaking about this. Everything is talking about this in the word of God. It's about a relationship with our creator, in humility, in love, in service. But knowing him, that's the objective. That's the goal to really get to know God. And brethren, we will. We will get to know God in this life, not just when we're resurrected, in this life. If, if we receive his words, if we treasure his commandments within us, if we incline our ear to, to understanding, to wisdom and apply our heart to understanding, if we do those things from the heart, if we really desire this way of life, if we really desire to be transformed and for God to show us things about ourselves as well, because he knows us better than we know ourselves. He's working with us. We are the end product. But let's read in Matthew 25, and we all know the parable of the, of the virgins in Matthew 25. But in verse, in verse 11, we know what happens. Five were wise and they bought extra oil and five were foolish and they didn't have enough. Let's read in verse 10 to understand what is happening, the conclusion of this parable. In verse 10, it says, And while they went to buy, these are the foolish virgins. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with them to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. What is his answer? In verse 12, But he answered and said, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. That's what matters. Brethren. What matters is knowing God. If you don't know God, if God doesn't know you, we're not going to be in his kingdom. This is how critical it is. This is how important it is. He didn't tell them, you don't have oil, you didn't do the works. No. 
Obviously, the, 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 the oil represents the Holy Spirit and the, and the light. It could be because the light, right? The, the, the light was supposed to like show who, who they are and see their face and say, come in, I know who you are. I can see your face. But that's how critical it is. When Jesus says that somebody's not going to be in the kingdom is because of this matter of not knowing the person and us not knowing him, not having that relationship because it goes both ways. Let's go to Luke 13. Luke 13. It's a similar account. Let's go to verse 22. Talking about Jesus. Now he was going through the cities and villages teaching while making progress toward Jerusalem. And one said to him, Lord, are those who are being saved few? And he said to them, he didn't say, yes, there are many, no, there are few. Yes, there are few, no, there are many. He didn't say any of that. Then he said to them, strive with your whole being. This sounds, incline your heart. Apply your heart to, to understanding. Do, do, do this as that you were seeking for silver, for hidden treasures. Strive with your whole being, with everything you are, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Dedicate yourself. It says to enter in through the narrow gate. For many, I will say to you, I say to you, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. Once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and you begin to stand outside the door and knock, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And then he shall answer and say to you, I do not know you or where you are from. But if we know God, he's going to know us too. If we know God, if we treasure those commandments, if we keep those words in our heart, if we are diligent to seek him, if we seek, if we cry out for understanding and for knowledge and for wisdom, not only to know or to understand, but to apply, to apply, to become like God, to be completely transformed, then he will know us. He will know us. He will know who we are, where we're from, and what we've done. And that's a very important many Many times we, we can think that it's because of the works. And yes, he does know our works. But he's more than that. He's beyond that. It's the final scripture. Let's go to Matthew 7. Matthew seven twenty one to illustrate yet another one of these instances. We know this one. Again, probably by memory as well. In verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the one who is doing the will of my father, who is applying understanding, who is seeking wisdom, having wisdom, acting like that, walking with God, knowing God, knowing what God wants and doing it. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy through your name? And did we not cast out demons through your name? And did we not perform many works of power through your name? And then I will confess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. That's why the first thing is to pay attention to his words and treasure those commandments within us. Those are the first things. Do not work lawlessness. But he, he will do that. But it requires all of these other things. It requires crying out for knowledge to God. And understanding and wisdom, he will give it to us. He will give it to us. We will know God if we dedicate ourselves to doing that. And he will show us amazing things every day from his word. Because that's what he wants. He wants a bride that is clean. He wants the body of Christ to be prepared, to be ready, to know him, to love him with all their heart, soul, mind, and being, and strength. This is how important is the knowledge of God.